shall assemble on the mountain. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts into his presence. We bring an offering of song, glory and honor and dominion unto the I'm Abby, my mom is Becky Craig, and one thing I love about my mom is that she has a servant heart. She's always doing something for someone else and she seems happy to do it. I love your hands. Your hands have loved me unconditionally since the day I was born. Wiped my tears, rejoiced with my happiness, cradled my face when I was sick, tucked me in at night when I was growing up, taught me compassion, tenderness, how to pray, hard work, how to tie a beautiful bow, how to make ordinary things extraordinary how to cook and bake, how to care for my family, and how to praise God for all the blessings He has given me. When I look at my hands, they look just like yours, and I pray that I can use them to be half as good of a mother as you are to me. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. I like Mom because she's funny, and she loves being with people, and um, she's always nice to people, and she's always helpful. Happy Mother's Day. I want to say happy Mother's Day to both of my moms. You know, they, have, they bring uh, wonderful things to the table and they just take care of me and they've done so much for me. I thank you for uh, both of you. And I just am very blessed to have had the opportunity to have both of you take care of me. I pray God continues to bless me each and every day. I love you both. Happy Mother's Day. This is Allie and Sam. Our mommy is Becky. Sam, what do we love about mommy? Uh, that she makes us food and that she does whatever it takes to help us. Yeah, that's right. She loves us really well. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Thank you for everything that you've done for us. When I think about my mom, I think about a home that's always welcome. The hospitality's always there. Come on in, make yourself at home. Uh, just always inviting. We appreciate and love our, our Nana. Nana. My mom, Carla Norman, for her generosity, kindness, and sweetheart. We love you, Nana. I love my mom because she's nice and something I appreciate about her is that she provides for our family. Happy Mother's Day. What we love about our mom is that she loves Jesus. What we appreciate about our mom is that she can dance like MC Hammer. Hammer time! <laughs> There are so many reasons why I love my mom, and for those of you who know her, know that she is very, very easy to love. So when I was a child, she was the best mom. Anytime I got sick, she was right there taking care of me. She is by far the best nurse and just very loving. She's got a servant heart. Um, she always wants to serve the people that she's around. Um, and that just comes naturally um, from her and because she loves God. And um, growing up, she always told me that 
I can always come to her with anything and no matter what I've done, she will always love me and always be there for me. And um, I just always felt that love from her. And now that I have my own children, it's wonderful to see her in that role of being our Nini and just being there to love on my kids and to help raise them. She's definitely a huge part of my village and I just love her. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom, to a very, very special lady who is loved by so many. Her sweet and kind nature, her giving and generous heart um, are just a few of her wonderful qualities. I love you, Mom. What do you guys love about Mama? I love her when she gives me kisses. Annie, what do you love about mom? Mm, love her when she's giving me hugs. I just wanted to say that I love you so much and happy Mother's Day. You deserve the absolute world because you put up with me. So that's a chore. Um, I love you so much. Happy Mother's Day. Mama, uh, I just wanna say that I love you a whole bunch and Thank you for taking me fun places. I love you, Mama. When I think of my mother, I'm in kindergarten and I come home for lunch and there's a chicken pot pie in the oven. My mama really loved me. My mom has this amazing ability to find joy in every day, even if it's been a no good, very bad day. When I grow up, I wanna be just like her. I love it when my mama takes me places. I love it when she lets me do her hair. I love it when she plays Barbies with me. And she's the best mommy ever. Hey mom, happy Mother's Day. Thank you for everything that you do, for making us feel special, for having fun with us, for teaching me how to be a mom. Love you so much, have a good day. Hey mom. hey mom. Hey mom. We sure love you and we're so thankful for you as a mom. All right. So what are we most thankful for mom for? Of uh, all the things mommy does for us. That she's nice, kind of that she's, that she's the best mom that we can ask for. Yeah. And taking she, care of her. And she takes care of us mm -hmm. and we're so thankful for her and we want to make this weekend very special for her. We love you. Love you. So. I just want to say how much I really appreciate mom. She's always been there through thick and thin and even through some of the other. She's awesome at being supportive of everything I've ever done and just a great help. I really appreciate her. Hey mom, just want to say happy Mother's Day and thank you for teaching me how to live like Jesus from the very beginning. Thank you so much for that. I haven't completely mastered patience yet or how to cook like you. I'm trying. Thank you for all you've done for my family, for me, and for the kingdom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. And Bevan, thank you for making our home better by your love and your joy just who you are. You make our you make our home better, but you make the world better. Happy Mother's Day. You're such a blessing. I love that my mom always answers the phone when I call to ask her where to find something in the grocery store or how to mail a package or something that I should know already how to do, but she always has the answer. And I'm so glad that she came all the way to Hot Springs to be with me on this Mother's Day. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before His throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah 
unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. From the ends of the earth, from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, National Park Church. Our first scripture reading of the morning comes from Luke, the first chapter. Yeah, that's verse 26. Uh, in the sixth month, Gabriel, the angel, was sent from God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man called Joseph from the family of David. The virgin was called Mary. Greetings, favored one, said the angel when he arrived. May the Lord be with you. She was disturbed at this and wondered what such a greeting might mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, said the angel to her. You're in favor with God. Listen, you will conceive in your womb and will have a son, and, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be a great man, and, he, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never come to an end. How will this happen? said Mary to the angel. I'm still a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, replied the angel, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For that, for the reason the Holy One is born from you will be called God's Son. Let me tell you this, too. Your cousin Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. This is the sixth month for her, a woman who people used to say was barren. With God, you see, nothing is impossible. Here I am, said Mary. I'm the Lord's servant girl. Let it happen to me as you have said. There are two accounts of the birth of Jesus in the New Testament. One in the book of Matthew and the other in the book of Luke. In Luke's account, we're introduced to a young woman named Mary who lived in Nazareth, a town in Galilee. A Galilee was located in the land of Israel, a very politically volatile area. She's part of a small group of marginalized people that have been conquered by one group after another. Every global power within the 700 years before the birth of Jesus had conquered this land. That's the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Seleucids, and finally the Romans. The historian Josephus records what happened when the Romans came to the land. Soldiers were allowed to slay the men, to take their families captive, to plunder their effects, and then burn the village. They even slaughtered people when they were in the temple. The land had been oppressed, the people victimized. Much of the population throughout Galilee is believed to have struggled to survive in a subsistence workers, tending livestock, fishing, and working the land just to put food on the table for their families and pay their taxes. It was estimated that Mary was 13 to 15 years old at the time of the angel's appearance. She's a peasant and engaged to be married. Uh, she is told she will, will have a child and that this this child will be great and will be called the son of, son of God and will sit on David's throne and reign over Israel forever. Given her socio socioeconomic status, none of this would seem very likely. When we think of the meeting between Gabriel and Mary and how he told her these outrageous things, might we wonder what part uh, of what the angel said would be harder to, to, to believe? Uh, in ancient time to be chosen or highly favored, meant you were to lead, to do something of great or courageous, which usually meant to go into battle, so you probably would not survive. Mary was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. 
and rightly so. But the angel told her to fear not. In her book, Year of Biblical Womanhood, the late Rachel Held Evans discussed one of her fears, which was the fear of motherhood. She was working on the chapter of one of her books involving children, and since she had no children of her own, she and her husband volunteered to babysit for some children of some friends of theirs. It did not work out well. She later acknowledged that fear on her blog. She said she was afraid that starting a family would put an end to her career. She was afraid she would never figure out how to use diaper genies. She was afraid that her inability to multitask would make her a bad mom. She was afraid of being responsible for another life. And she was afraid of bringing into this world a little person who can and probably would be hurt and disappointed. Now, when Mary was told she would have a son, that he would have a throne, that he would reign and have a kingdom, she was essentially told she was going to be the mother of a ruler, the mother of a revolution. Yet her response to all this was, here I am. I'm the Lord's servant girl. Let it happen to me as you said, or in more modern terms, I'm in. Mary's story reminds us that God's aware of all of his children and that he calls ordinary men and women to participate in extraordinary ways to help build his kingdom. Mary's story also reminds us that the story isn't over, that for thousands of years, people of faith, regardless of who's in power, have kept their heads up, their hearts open, and have been willing to say, I'm the Lord's servant. I'm in. Thank you. And um, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise your name. We gather to serve you and to thank you for all that you have done in our lives. We know that nothing good can be gained apart from you, and nothing bad can come from your hand. We praise you for your mercy. We thank you for the gift of your word. We ask you to come open our hearts and our minds to hear you. May we learn something new each time we read and study. Please forgive us when we use self-effort to work toward our expected outcome, instead of faith to surrender our will and embrace your outcome, when we believe our plans are better than yours. We ask that you bless this meeting today, all those present, as well as the lives of those who we will encounter afterward. Help us to make every moment count. Keep us physically safe and guard our hearts and minds from pride and selfishness. Help us to love those that, that you love. In Jesus' name, amen. The God of the
Good morning, National Park, and happy Mother's Day. You know, it's a, it's a great day to have on the calendar in which we remember and give honor to our mothers. Uh, I know that many of you are thinking of mothers today, and if, we're, if you're blessed to have your mother with you, maybe you have the opportunity to visit her. But we're in these isolated times, and it may just be communication and visits or talking. Uh, but... What a great day in which we have to honor our mothers. And I'm blessed to have my mother still alive and Dina's mother still alive as well. And we can do that today. You know, I'm reminded also on Mother's Day of, of Jesus's mother, Mary. Mary was such a special person. She was chosen by God to give birth to Jesus and to raise him in childhood up to an adult. And I can't even imagine <laughs> you know, and what that experience, is, experience was for Mary, such a strange experience, but uh, what an honor uh, for Mary and, and, and what a woman she was. And, and I know, I have no doubt that Mary and Jesus were close throughout their relationship. We know this from scripture that uh, Mary was, not only did he raise Jesus as a child, but she transitioned to being a disciple and a believer. She was always a believer, even to the end. We know in the gospel account of John, and I'm paraphrasing, when, when Jesus was hanging on the cross in his final hour, he looked at his mother and, and he said, uh, dear woman, this is your son, speaking of John. And then he turned to John and said, this is your mother. And from that account, we know that John took her, Mary, into his home that very hour. So it's a great day to have on the calendar that we can honor mothers, but maybe more importantly, we also have on the calendar today, Sunday, each Sunday, a time in which we give honor to Jesus, uh, our Savior. And we, and we remember him at this time in communion, just as he asked us to do in the Lord's Supper when he took the bread and took the cup and he asked his disciples at that time to take this in remembrance of me. And so we do that today. We, uh, we will take the cup and we will take the bread and we'll do just that. We'll remember Jesus. 
But I want you to know as we partake of this communion, and we're in communion together, partaking of the bread and the cup, that although we're separated, that we're each in our homes right now, please be aware that we don't do this alone. Our Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are doing the same thing with us today. Together, we are taking this day and remembering our Savior. And for what he, not only for what he did, but what he means in our lives. So let's pray now. Dear Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings we have in life, the blessings of our mothers, the blessings of our family, the blessings of our church at National Park. Father, we're so, <clears throat> so thankful for our greatest blessing in Jesus Christ, for what he did in sacrificing himself on our behalf. Father, we're so thankful for that sacrifice. And as we partake of this bread and this cup, we remember that sacrifice. And we remember the impact that that now has on our lives. Father, forgive us when we do wrong, but also please assure us of your grace and mercy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hope to see you soon. My soul. Good morning, National Park. Um, really excited about this Sunday and continuing our sermon series. But before we dive into that, I, I want to just also put my um, word of appreciation to the mothers in our church family and just um, just each of us that have been shaped by um, the love and care that our mothers have given us. Uh, I can speak as one who has a mom that deeply loved me as a, as a kid, had a zeal and passion for the Lord um, that I'm immensely grateful for. Uh, I was raised in a family where uh, a passion for God was modeled to me by my mom. And then as a husband of uh, Kara, who's a new mom, we've been parenting for a little over two years, but to get, get to watch her have her passion for God expressed in the loving kindness for our kids, the amazing ability where she has uh, the capacity to seek the good of um, Harper and Emerson uh, in just deep and practical ways is um, 
just an incredible gift. And so I just want to say that I'm blessed by the, the mother figures in my life. And I'm just so thankful um, to be able to celebrate this day. It's such an important day uh, to celebrate all the moms that are pouring themselves out um, day in and day out to, to love their own kids, but also to love um, the kids in our church family as a whole and then to live to love the kids in our community. So I just want to send out my shout out and thanks to the moms as well. This Sunday, we're continuing our sermon series entitled Reading Backwards. And I'll just give a brief synopsis of what that is. I've, I've done that the past couple weeks. Reading backwards is intended to, to say that all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation is read correctly through the lens of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And for this series in particular, we're saying that Jesus' life and his ministry and his teaching come to their fullest expression, and the interpretive key for those is his death on a cross and his resurrection. That those are the lenses that make sense of the way in which he lived, the things that he taught, and the way he participated in ministry. And so I am excited about continuing that this morning to look at the stories in the gospel through the lens of the cross and the resurrection. And again, what we've said each week is the, the resurrection itself, um, and I think this is important for us to remember, is a vindication of those things we just described, of his life, his ministry, and his teaching. What we learn from the resurrection is that the kind of life he lived and the kind of things that he taught are what it means to truly be human. That if we inhabit the world the way that Jesus models for us and taught us to, we will be living a full human life. And I think for today, uh, particularly that understanding of reading it through the lens of the cross is going to be immensely important for us to, to get the fullness of what this text wants us to get. But before we pray, and before we dive into um, the passage we're going to look at this morning, I want to give a quick disclaimer. One of the things about preaching sermons is that you're never able to say everything that you possibly should say or could say on a particular topic. And I think we feel this when we read scripture, right? When we're looking at the Bible or reading particular texts, there's oftentimes we, we want the, the text to say more than it does. Give us a practical application. Tell me what that means for my specific situation. And the topic we're looking at this morning is forgiveness. And I think one danger of talking about forgiveness is that oftentimes throughout history, Christian understanding of forgiveness has made people think that they had to act in a particular and tangible way in a certain situation that has been unhealthy for them and has not been for their good. Let me try to elaborate on that. Many people have falsely assumed that if you are going to forgive someone, that means that that person should never experience any cons consequences, that you should remain in relationships that are abusive that you turn a blind eye to the real injustices that are happening to you or to somebody else. Or that because you're going to be a person who forgives, that means in a very concrete and tangible way, you do this every single time in every single relationship. And I don't think there's a cookie cutter response to how forgiveness manifests itself in each and every situation. So as we teach about forgiveness, I hope that you do not falsely assume that if somehow you're in an abusive relationship right now, or you're experiencing some genuine and real hurts and pains and injustices, that I'm telling you that the way in which you forgive someone means that you have to stay in that relationship in the same exact way you're engaging in it right now, that you don't distance yourself, distance yourself from those toxic and harmful situations, that there is not a, here's a formula to if you're really going to forgive someone, here's how you always tangibly act towards them in a particular situation. That there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of complexity there. And what I want to say is behind all of that, you are called to forgive. But as the disclaimer at the very beginning of this, that does not assume somehow that you have to remain in something that is abusive, toxic, and unhealthy. And I think that's just really important that that's a disclaimer behind the things that we teach. Because if we're going to take Jesus' teaching seriously, I think it's important for us to know that what that does not mean is maybe some of these false applications that people have assumed forgiveness requires. That forgiveness does not require, and it's actually not for your good or the good of that person. 
So with that in mind, let's pray and then we'll dive into the text this morning. God, we are in a broken world, a world that often wounds us and hurts us, and we also participate in the wounding and hurting of others. And we pray that the example that your son gives and the life that he lived and the things that he taught will get absorbed by us in such a real way that we can, as Paul says, be his ambassadors in this world, that we can be a little glimpse of the kind of world that is made possible through the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Help us to have eyes to see what you want us to see in this text and ears to hear what you want us to hear. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than about the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again I tell you, that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. 
Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you, unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Before we dive into the text that was read, Matthew chapter 18, I think it's important to to take a quick um, glance or uh, highlight a, a fact about the story that's not actually in the story itself, which is who is the one who is teaching in Matthew chapter 18? If you know me, you know that I um, really love to read and to study and that in my graduate work, I've grown to love the setting of an academic classroom, that I love the 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 banter about ideas, the engagement with very serious subjects. But I think it's important before we engage with the topic we're looking at today to, to name and acknowledge that that is not the setting that Jesus is teaching from. That Jesus is not sitting in some ivory tower and philosophizing or um, theorizing about forgiveness. Forgiveness for him is not isolated or distant from the actual life that he's going to live. That when we talk about Jesus' teaching of forgiveness, we need to constantly put to the forefront of our minds the fact that the one who is teaching on this subject is the very one whose life of forgiveness led him to a cross. That he is not unaware of the consequences of living a kind of life like this. That he very well knows that forgiveness is not always easy, but it's easy, but it's very costly. And I think that's really, really important because it's similar to if in the 1950s or 60s, Martin Luther King Jr. stepped foot in a classroom and was teaching about nonviolent resistance or nonviolent protesting. Now, you may not agree with him 100%, but what you couldn't say is, oh, well, he just theorizes about this. He doesn't actually live into that way of life. No, he embodied the very same things that he taught. Or there's a difference between me preaching about foreign missions, which should be preached about and is a really important topic, but it would be different than Chad and Amy Westerholm coming and teaching us about what their experiences are like in Mozambique and what their convictions are about foreign missions, because it costs them something. It affects the way that they actually have lived their lives. And when Jesus teaches about forgiveness, he's not unaware of what that means and the practical implications for one's life. So I think that we need to be really careful when we come to texts like this and say, but Jesus doesn't understand. He doesn't get my particular situation. Because the one who's teaching on this realizes that forgiveness sometimes doesn't lead to easy outcomes or comfortable situations, but could lead to a cross. And so with that in mind, let's dive into the passage itself. It begins with Peter in very Peter-like fashion. And I think a lot of us have an affinity towards him because he asks the question that all of us are thinking but are not bold enough to ask. And so Jesus has been doing all this teaching and it's clear that his kingdom is predicated in a certain sense on forgiveness. And so Peter wants to get down to business. All right, just tell us how many times do we have to forgive? It's a good question, right? So, all right, we have all this theory and we have all this... uh, abstract ideas about the kind of life we need to live, but let's just get to the practical, the nuts and bolts. Give us a concrete answer. How many times do I actually have to forgive my brother when he sins against me? And the beauty of this is Peter gives a hypothetical or a possible answer. He says, seven times? Now, you don't throw out a number unless you think it's somewhat impressive. Right? He assumes, hey, this is the perfect number in Hebrew, or this is a a lot. If to forgive my brother seven times, that would take a lot of um, strain and willpower on my part. But Jesus does to Peter what I've found that Kara does to me a lot of times. There's so many times where I'll be 
watching a sporting event, and I'll be really, really impressed because I think, man, this guy just scored 60 points, and I can't wait to tell somebody. And Kara's in the room right next door to me, and I, I say, you're not going to believe how many points this person scored. And then she guesses, and she says, 150. And I go, oh, well, no. I thought you were going to be impressed by my number 60, but not anymore. Because when I say 60 and you guessed 150, it feels like a letdown rather than something impressive. Or you'll see a, a house on Zillow, and I'll be like, you're not going to imagine how much it costs. And Carol will say, $5 million. I'll be like, well, it's actually $2 million. I thought you were going to be a little impressed, but now it, it's a little underwhelming. And I think Jesus does something similar, because Peter has this big number of seven times do I forgive. And Jesus says, well, actually, 70, either 70 times seven or 77 times. That's really important for us to note at this point that you don't get out your notes if you're taking notes at this and say, okay, I have to forgive either 77 times or 70 times seven, and let me do the math. And then in your particular situation, say, all right, I'm going to start a tally, especially with my spouse, and we're in this quarantine. So he's going to start getting check marks, and if it's 77 times, man, he could reach that pretty quickly. It might not even take a week for him to reach that mark. Like, that's not the point of what Jesus is teaching. He's not giving a math equation. He's inviting us into a space of a kind of forgiveness that is inexhaustible. But the way he gets to that, the way he illustrates that is really powerful because he does what Jesus often does. He reframes the question for the person who is asking it. It's similar to in the Good Samaritan story. If you remember in Luke chapter 10, the question is posed to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus could give an answer like, well, everyone's your neighbor. Or that's a bad question, but he reframes it, right? He tells a story about this man who's beaten by robbers and is lying in a ditch, half dead. And there's these three guys that walk by him, and only one of them stops to help him, and it's the Samaritan. But that reframes the entire question, because when you read that text now, and you ask the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus is wanting the person to be thinking of, well, if I'm lying in a ditch, half dead, who, which one of these people? men were a neighbor to me. That it reframes it because when I'm the one who's in the ditch, I now want the person whoever's going to help me. That's who is ultimately my neighbor. Likewise, he reframes this question that Peter asks because he puts him in a different perspective than he originally is when he asks the question. Right? Because Peter, when he's asking this question, assumes I am solely the victim that the person has wronged me, I'm in the right, they're in the wrong, and that's the totality of the perspective from which the question arises. And so if Jesus offered this parable in answer to Peter's question, we may not have the same reaction that we do when we actually read the parable that Jesus offers for us. Imagine if Jesus only said, there was a guy who owed uh, man number one, lent money to man number two. So there's these two guys. One of them lent money to the other. They agreed upon a date when that money had to be paid back. And let's hypothetically say the parable was man number one gave man number two seven different opportunities to pay the money back. But man number two kept pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing it back and pushing it back. Till finally the man said, all right, enough is enough. You better pay me back right now or I'm throwing you into prison. Now we may say that seems a bit harsh, but on the surface of that telling, we go, that, that makes a little bit of sense. I mean, if the guy's going to keep taking advantage of him and not paying him back, there's something wrong, right? That on the surface, it doesn't seem so absurd. So I ask the question, why is it when this man in this story is choking the guy saying, pay me back, do we find it as the most absurd response that we've ever heard. It's because the framing of the story. Because what gives the, the fullness of the context of the parable that Jesus teaches and the lesson that he's letting us see is the fact that this man, the one who is literally choking the man saying, pay me back, had literally just had an astronomical amount of money canceled, a debt that he owed canceled literally just moments previously before he treats this man who owes him money 
in this particularly unkind fashion. Do you see? The absurdity is not just in the action itself. It's in the fact that we know who this person is and what has just taken place with them. And how could they, after they have had their debt canceled, after they owed the kind of money that the, the Greek language is trying to express is similar to what like a kid says, well, I'm going to have an affinity amount of dollars or a zillion dollars. It's a kind of amount that is inconceivable. That's what he owed this king. And the king said, it's gone. It's taken away. And what makes his action against the other man, the man that owed him money, so absurd is how could someone come in contact with that kind of grace and forgiveness and then be so unaware that he doesn't extend that grace and forgiveness to somebody else? You see how that reframes the entire conversation. If I ask Peter's question from the perspective, not merely as one who has to forgive, not merely from the posture as the victim, but now as one who has been forgiven, the question sounds drastically different. As one who has had the God of the universe step into my brokenness and my sin and my devastation, who at my worst moments, at the moments where I need infinite amount of grace, has shown that grace to me, has shown that love to me, even when it led him to the cross. If I get that, and if I see that, to ask the question, okay, at what point do I get to not show that kind of love and forgiveness to another person, sounds about as absurd as what this guy does to the man who owes him money after he had his astronomical debt canceled. The response of this man is about as absurd if the prodigal son had a child one day and the child did the same exact thing with his inheritance and went off to the far country and came back home and the father said, nope, I can't forgive you. I can't embrace you back. You're never allowed in my house ever again. That would be absurd because of the grace that he encountered from his own father. That reframes Peter's question. If I am one who has tasted the immense forgiveness and grace of God, can I imagine getting to a place where I don't have to forgive another person? Where they've gone too far? Where they're beyond the pale of grace and forgiveness? Likely, I think what Jesus is saying is you probably haven't understood how much you've been forgiven if you reach a point where you think you no longer need to forgive another person. And I think that in theory makes sense, but we may still have a little bit of a feeling of, yeah, but that's so hard. That's so hard to do. Like, I, I don't want to live that way. Like, it feels like Jesus, like he's, it's right. And in theory, I get his point, but in practical application, forgiving people is really hard. Is Jesus not adding a burden to my life? And I'm going to give two reasons why I actually don't think this is an added burden, but this is a gift of freedom. Number one, it is only when we forgive in the way that God has forgiven us and as illustrated in this parable that we break the cycle of you do this to me so I respond in kind or the Old Testament adage of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Now there is a grace in that because it, it limits the amount of revenge that one could have, right? You could only respond in kind, but to totally break that cycle, in the cycle of, well, if you do this to me, then this means I have to respond to you in the same exact way or in kind. To break that requires at some point someone to extend forgiveness. The only way to break the cycle of our brokenness where we continually repeat the hurts that we've received and then hurt other people is to have someone say, all right, I'm going to absorb it. I'm going to be the one who's willing to forgive. The cross is the perfect embodiment of that. Jesus has people mocking him, spitting him, ultimately hanging him on a cross. And he could, the famous song, right? He can call down 10,000 angels, but because he was willing not to respond in kind, not to treat people as he was being treated in that moment, not to treat his enemy as an enemy, but as one to be loved and forgiven, he breaks the cycle that much of us are wrapped up in. Where I like those who like me and I don't like those who don't like me where I extend grace to those who I think are deserving of grace, and I withhold grace and mercy to those who I don't think are deserving of that. The only way to break the cycle is if you participate in forgiveness. The famous kind of American historical example is the Hatfields and the McCoys. These two rival families, one on 
the West Virginia line and one on the Kentucky line, and they get in this dispute, and death after death after death after death happens because we got to get them back. They did this to us, so we have to respond in kind. And no one wins. How many battles on the world scale, how many deaths, how many wars have taken place because we have this mentality where forgiveness is not our ordinary and normal posture. Now, I'm not saying that I have foreign policy figured out by any means, but I'm just saying it's not just on an individual scale, it's on a global scale, this idea of responding in kind. And Jesus gives us a way to imagine a world that can break this devastating cycle of, I only like those, I only love those who I deem deserving of love. And the way you break it is to first recognize that I need forgiveness, I need love, I need something I don't deserve. And in light of that, I have now the capacity to extend that to others. Second thing that I think this is not a burden imposed by Jesus, but it's actually a gift of freedom is the fact that we falsely assume oftentimes that me having to give up my, my grudge or my harboring of hatred or my harboring of anger of a certain person is giving something up that is, actually gives me power. But I want us to think about this. Is it not the one who is able to forgive that is the most powerful person you could ever imagine? The person who can't forgive, the person who's unable to forgive, the person who has to respond in a way that they think is, is giving the person what they deserve is actually a less free person than the person who can forgive. Here's why. Because your action is now contingent upon the action of another. They get to determine how you're going to respond to them. Since they act to me this way, they determine how I'm going to respond to them. But in the framework that Jesus offers, someone can act in an unjust unkind, unloving way to me, and that does not dictate how I'm going to respond to them. Because I can choose rather to take the path of Jesus and respond, and respond in love and forgiveness and generosity. There's something deeply empowering, and, and I've used the story a lot, but the story of Stephen being pelted by stones, and he is the freest man in that room because he doesn't have to respond in hatred and violence. He can respond in love and forgiveness, which does not make him weak, does not make him a doormat, but makes him the freest man in that particular setting. Also on that, and most of you know this experientially, our harboring of anger and grudges and hatred towards other people never brings you more full a more full existence or life. It always brings you to a place where you feel broken and you begin to deteriorate because that anger and that hatred is actually destroying you inside. You know that experience, right? That usually the inability to forgive does more harm to the person who's unable to forgive than the one who is not forgiven. That the one who harbors the deepest consequences of being unable to forgive is most often the person who is unwilling to forgive, not the person who is not receiving the forgiveness. That when you can release that person, when you can forgive, it actually is freeing you from the burden of having to harbor that hatred and that grudge and that animosity towards another person. That what Jesus is inviting us into is not an easy life. It is a life that has consequences. It is a life that is costly, but it is a life of freedom because a life where we can imagine a world where forgiveness becomes the foundation, not you get what you deserve, you get what you're owed. We can imagine a new world that is predicated on grace. And a world predicated on grace is the only world that you and I can have any hope in. And it all means also that we can extend hope to those who find themselves in a deeply hopeless situation. What Jesus is offering his people is, do you want an existence that's predicated on forgiveness, or do you want an existence that is predicated on getting what you deserve? And if you understand this Christian story in any meaningful way, you'll recognize you don't want an existence predicated on what you deserve because that leaves you in your brokenness and your sin, and it leaves you as a person 
who is not receiving the forgiveness that we are constantly receiving, but just is constantly getting what's owed us. And what's owed us is not a beautiful, pristine world with communion with God. But if it's a world predicated on grace and forgiveness, it's a world where we can mend the broken wounds that we've received for one another, and we can be restored in a beautiful communion with the living God. Maybe a way to frame this is that Jesus is asking us, what kind of world do you want to inhabit? And what, do you, what kind of world do you want to live in? A world of grace and forgiveness or the broken, distorting, and devastating world that we usually inhabit? And for Christians, we're invited to say, we choose the path of forgiveness. Let's pray. God, thank you for your patience and your mercy. And we can't talk about everything that needs to be talked about, but this is a really, really hard teaching. But we pray that through the power of your spirit, you will allow us to live into the form of life which is predicated on forgiveness that you want us to live into. Thank you for the mercy that you've extended to us. It's an incredible gift. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. National Park Church, I am so thankful that you've joined us that you've worshiped with us, and I pray that you will go and extend the forgiveness that you've tasted in the God revealed in Jesus Christ, and you will extend that to everyone that you come in contact with, that you will begin to reimagine the world through the lens of grace and forgiveness. Have a great week.